Hello everyone, welcome to your individual weekly show, the panel. This panel starts now. Uh, we are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Uh, we are also viewed in the Horn of Africa through satellite. So uh, those who are following us on satellite as well in Ethiopia and the Horn, uh, thank you for uh, following us. Those who are following us live now online, please share subscribe so that many can uh, access this material today uh, i have three panelists two the uh, regular panelists professor Skel gabisa and uh, paisa robla will be talking about ethiopia in the eyes and heart of the imf latest developments and outlook emd media uh, has received a document a brief document uh, where the IMF has a lot of data about Ethiopia's current economy and the outlook. And Dr. Tsagai Gabrakidan, who is a development economics, economist, has joined us. It's a great pleasure to have you, uh, Dr. Gabrakidan. And um, what attracted my attention as well is you are an avid runner place on Twitter. Uh, That's right. So, so maybe we will see you in one of these uh, world competitions some somehow. <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, let's start with the usual format. So, what stood out for each panelist? Uh, Professor Skell, let us start there. What was the highlight for you? Well, I I think it's um, a lot of little things happened. Uh, in Ethiopia, including the incident in uh, the Somali region, which I hope that uh, um, Faisal is able to speak about. And there's been also, um, where in the world is Abi, Abi Ahmed, little things, but of course, a man that is so uh, interested in being in front of the, uh, the camera, was not in front of the camera for a very long time. That was really a, a concern. And finally, um, uh, there was uh, a tape that was recorded about, I don't know, tape about 12 years, days ago. And in that, something was revealed. And I'm not, I am not interested in as if that is an, an important highlight. What I am really interested in is to um, underscore what I have been saying about the problem in that country. So, there are there have been in history uh, people who suffer from psychosis who have acceded to the pinnacles of power in their own country. Uh, Nero is one of them who burned Rome uh, and was interested in uh, uh, watching it while the, the place is being burned down. Now the the intricacies the uh, awkwardness is is. Uh, maybe not in the public realm, but is what is important is for me, what I have been saying on this panel for a very long time, this country's multi-dimensional problems emanate from the failure of leadership. And when I say that failure of leadership, it's not about capabilities. It's not about sincerity. It's not about knowledge. It is about the fact that a sick man is actually le leading that country. It all emanates from the lack of wellness, whether that is political, psychological, anything else. So this conversation in the in the way that the prime minister appeared on television after a, a long hiatus, after a long absence, his demeanor, his uh, appearance did not seem right. But that's not important for me. Uh, people could make all kinds of things about how people appear. It's not normal, but simply adds up to that question that I had. The country is led by a person who is suffering from some kind of psychiatric disorder. One of that psychiatric disorder is, now people might not really want to take that, but what I am trying to say is that his conversation with the newly elected leader of the Majlis, president of the Majlis, Sheikh Ibrahim Tufa actually tells about one of his disorders, 
one of the, the, the psychiatric problems that he suffers from. That is narcissism. Narcissism is not just scientific self-love. Sci narcissism is uh, a condition. It's a psychological condition that needs treatment. So what I saw in that conversation with him is narcissism on display. Narcissism as a, patholo a pathology, a disorder, a, psychi a psychiatric dis disorder. And I just wanted to say something about that uh, conversation with the, the sheikh. So Abi Ahmed asks, uh, do you like me? And do you believe I am your son? The sheikh responds, the entire Muslim community likes you. Abi dis, uh, uh, interrupts and he say, no, no, no. The question is, does Sheikh Ibrahim, you, like me or not? Does Sheikh Ibrahim see me as your son or not? That's my question. The Sheikh says, well, that's obvious, known to the, known to the public. Abi responds, saying, I want to hear it from you right now. I wanted to hear it right now. And Sheikh Ibrahim says, are you asking me if I like you? And he says, yes. Well, he says, I like you. Now that is, that is something, that kind of conversation is something, but it is underscores, it underscores the point that I have been making and I just got the opportunity to make it again, to underscore it. In history, there have been people who have suffered from psychiatric disorder that have led their countries. I, I just mentioned one from ancient Rome, but there is also a couple of leaders in Africa. Bedel, uh, Bokassa is John Bedel Bokassa is one, Ia Deman is another. These were patently sick people. The problem in this country that people always want to rationalize <laughs> And I want everybody to know my, from my perspective, I'm now psychi no psychiatrist. The problem is one man, a man suffering from psychiatric disorder. And that this week was on display. That is what I think stood out for me. Thank you, uh, Ms. Gell. Uh, Faisal, what about you? What stood out for you? <clears throat> well, that was heavy, Ms. Gell. <laughs> Yeah, uh, what stood out for me was, of course, the the incursion uh, of uh, supposedly Al Shabab troops into vast, vast areas of the Somali region uh, that is abutting and adjacent to the Oromo region in the Afder area, what we used to call Bale area. And basically, uh, they came and they really uh, uh, literally obliterated several settlements in the area, including some, uh, you know, good-sized districts or uh, or uh, regional uh, headquarters. Not really like uh, uh, Afler is a very huge, huge uh, uh, zone. But I think uh, Hergel, the town that is also uh, good size, were also almost fell subject to Al Shabaab. Three, four areas that they literally ransacked, killed the people, including high-ranking uh, Liu police uh, personnel, and took several. Uh, this uh, truck that you see, uh, supposedly and reportedly, belongs to one of the colonels of the Liu police, which is probably the highest rank that they have. Now, it is quite uh, unsettling that Al-Shabaab comes through uh, a region called Baidabo of Somalia, Bakor, which is where the Ethiopian contingent that is in Somalia as part of the peace uh, peacekeeping force is stationed. So you have Al-Shabaab, then you have Ethiopian contingency towards the Ethiopian border. So the one question that a lot of people are asking for in terms of security point of view is how did these guys come all the way from Baidabo area and, and passed or at least skirted around the Ethiopian uh, 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 
army that's stationed in Baidabu to get to Afdar, which is hinterland. And reportedly, they came and entered Ethiopian uh, Somali region into about 70 uh, uh, kilometers. So that's, that's a very good question. The second question is, in the years that the previous uh, uh, regional administrator, Abdi Muhammad Umar, also known as Abdi Ili, was there, uh, Al-Shabaab never dared to come to that area despite all the challenges that police, new police had in the region, they kept Al-Shabaab at bay, at least as far as the Somali region is concerned. Now, with supposedly uh, a government that has more support than the previous one, how did this happen that they will come all the way? I mean, 70 kilometers and coming deep into Afdar and reaching almost to the area where Romos and Somalis border in that area is not a small feat. That's raising another question. There are now allegations and name calling uh, that is being circulated. As you know, the Ethiopian government, both at the local as well as at the regional level, has a national level, has not issued a single comment on this, except some uh, pro-Mustafa uh, disabled uh, media, which often are paid, that uh, really did commentary about reporting. The only legitimate report that came out of this was uh, the uh, this Reuters report, which also admittedly reported that the Somali regional government said no comment up to this. So there are ways that Somalis are reading from their own vantage point of view about this. Number one, the Somali Congress for uh, Somali cause, uh, Congress for Somali cause literally chided the administration, which is an opposition party, and demanded a clear and uh, open assessment of the security breakdown. Uh, the the chairman of that group tweeted and said they they feel that there was a compromise in the security sector, and they want a report and an investigation. The Ogaden National Liberation Front ONLF condemned Al Shabaab and also showed uh, their really sympathy toward uh, the people who have been harmed, whether they are the Liu police or the public at large. What the cynical administration in Jigjiga tried to do by giving uh, uh, tips to their Facebook based, uh, what Somalis call CBB, uh, you know, uh, meaning uh, really. A very drug, the children of this of, of, of Facebook basically wanted to connect this debacle to several groups. And this is strictly coming from Mustafa Umar's office. They wanted to link the Al Shabaab to OLF, Romo Liberation Front, Ogaden National Liberation Front, and TPLF. This is the joke that he was, uh, Scale was in a different context talking about. Instead of really telling the public, what had happened, where has the shortage of and, and shortcoming of security took place. They think they can just uh, lie to the 110 million people in Ethiopia, and particularly the Somali and Oromo people who have been impacted in that area and see that they can, you know, again, put this thing under the rug. Having said that, there are people who are accusing Mustafa and his team as even having some connection remotely connection with this issue. As you guys recall, Abiy Ahmed in his last criticism of the Jijiga administration did not say that there are Al-Shabaab activities in the Jijiga administration. Today, one of uh, the leaders of the uh, uh, Congress for Somali cause, Ahmed Absiye, who was also part of Mustafa's uh, Facebook activists in the 2018 and prior, basically said that there is a connection between some of the religious functions inside Jigjiga and what had happened. And he is detailing a lot of facts that I cannot put it here, but his entire interview, which runs for about 30 minutes, is on Karamarda TV, which I'm sure the Ethiopian government and the security forces will transcribe and see what they can find. But in any case, you know, uh, in short, this is a massive, massive breakdown 
of the security structure in the border area. One last issue. There has been today uh, a video clip that has been circulating that is showing some pro-government people driving through and collecting heavy, heavy armaments from people who still have their, you know, their typical, uh, uh, you know, skirt or if you will, shirt Somalis. And basically the, the, the armies that these people, uh, weapons these people are carrying should never be in the hands of average farmers and regular people. Who gave them? We don't know. But some people are speculating and saying that these people were also people, you know, who were armed by some people who could be part of the security structure to create a fiasco, to create an environment that, you know, th this whole thing is uh, is uh, done by Asha. Anyway, it is really a mess. The government hasn't said anything. The regional government hasn't said anything, except some who spoke on behalf of Liu police who say that they are fighting Al-Shabaab. I think Al-Shabaab has broken the security system of that area and come freely deep into Ethiopia as far as 70 kilometers. And that is a very unacceptable situation for the people who are critical of the Mustafa and Abiyah government. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal, for that. And Dr. Zagai, once again, uh, great that you joined us today and welcome. And uh, what stood out for you? What is the highlight for you over the past seven days, the past week? Uh, thank you very much for having me. This is my first time. Um, uh, well, a couple of things. Uh, one, it, it's probably a bit, uh, I'm probably a bit late uh, and probably a bit too optimistic and naive. But, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the, the potential of the, the peace negotiation between the Ethiopian federal government and the uh, Tigray uh, regional government, uh, both of the parties now uh, have set up uh, teams. So um, no meeting has uh, has been, you know, um, done yet. Um, but, you know, there has been rumors that there might be uh, meetings uh, in a matter of weeks. Um, from the economic point of view, uh, what stood out to me is uh, about exports and imports in Ethiopia where uh, there was, uh, bizarrely, there was shortage of containers to export um, coffee and others uh, from Ethiopia and the, in the dry ports. And the reason is because uh, imports has declined because government has put, um, has practically blocked uh, imports of capital goods by the private sector. So there are no containers that go to Ethiopia from Djibouti. And normally they would take exports once they unload their, their imported uh, stuff. But since import has practically you know, uh, declined, the exporters uh, really struggled to find containers to export their products. So, so that was pretty bizarre and that pretty much uh, stood out for me. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, guy. Uh, we will start with you for the topic of the day. So the Topic of the day, is, uh, as I mentioned before, is about the recent, just two days old, uh, material from uh, the IMF. And uh, based on that, we'll be talking about Ethiopia in the eyes and heart of the IMF. I chose these words, eyes, how they see based on their field study that happened in mid-June and heart what they want to make out of it based on that document and latest developments and outlook. So Dr. Tagai, uh, I want you to walk us through what the numbers say in terms of the health of the economy and maybe in terms of what it covers and so on. So there are um, around seven, eight, uh, maybe six, I could be wrong, graphs that are I would be displaying while you talk about that. So. What, how should we understand the data, the graph, the uh, numbers uh, in that report? Sure. Uh, you, you may start. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much again. So this is a report, uh, a field report uh, after, as you said, I may have uh, conducted a field visit um, in Ethiopia. And, um, and I think the main objective is it is probably a part of uh, IMF's uh, uh, plan to, to have a financial support plan for Ethiopia in the, in, you know, in, in the Ottoman uh, but before that, um, as you all know, Ethiopia has uh, applied for um, debt treatment as part of the common framework. Um, so IMF uh, is calling on G20 and other uh, creditors to somehow reschedule Ethiopia's debt so that IMF um, can also implement uh, its uh, financial support uh, plan for Ethiopia. So, so overall, this report um, sort of provides a, a, a very uh, dark uh, picture of the economy. Uh, you know, um, the, the economy, the GDP has been uh, slowing down. Um, inflation, there is a very, very high inflation. Um, so, for example, here uh, the the second the second graph um, shows the sort of the GDP growth in the last uh, sort of four years. So it came down. It was about nine percent in in, in 20, uh, 18, 19, and then six point one, and then again six point one, and then the sort of forecast for 2021, 2022 is about three point eight percent. So this is quite a big slowdown. Uh, given that Ethiopia is known to have been registering, you know, double digits um, economic growth in, the, in most of the years in the last 20 years. Uh, of course, for me, even this 3.8 uh, projection is quite exaggerated as, uh, you know, there is conflict uh, in many parts of the country and especially in, in Tigray where the whole economy is, is, is completely uh, uh, shackled. Um, so, so unless this 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 forecast is for let's say for Ethiopia, excluding the Tigray region, maybe. But if we take the whole Ethiopia, even this three point eight is quite uh, an exaggeration, in my opinion. And the other uh, finding is, uh, you know, is, is very high inflation. Inflation uh, at the moment in the, the, is about thirty five percent on average. The blue line you see on the right um, and of course the, the the food inflation is the main one which is close to 40 percent as you can see and then the non-food uh, inflation is about probably 25 percent or so but the average is about 35 percent and as you can see from the graph uh, you know inflation has been a challenge for a growing economy like Ethiopia uh, however from around May 2021 which is around 15 months it has jumped a lot to about to, to more than 30% and now to around 35%. So this is this is a very, very concerning uh, situation for Ethiopia. So the IMF report has also highlighted that. Um, and the other uh, sort of indicator for, uh, for the health of an economy is there are various macroeconomic uh, imbalances. Uh, one of them is here as uh, deficit. So there's the gen general government deficit. This is the sort of the difference between government revenue and government expenditure. So as you know, as part of the homegrown economic plan in 2018, 2019, there was a sort of a, a promise by government to you know, bring down a deficit to, um, however, uh, when you look at the, at, the, at, the, at the picture, at the graph, especially after 2020, 2021, uh, the sort of the deficit as a percentage of GDP has skyrocketed. So it's about 4% now. So Ethiopia in the last 20 years has never had a deficit more than 3%, even in the period where public expenditure was really the driver of economic growth in the country. So, um, so as you can see, it's sort of forecasted to be around 4%. So any, any uh, deficit more than 3% is considered to be a concern uh, for any country. And the next graph um, is, uh, is, is sort of the, the change in expenditure composition of, of the government. So what is really driving this, this deficit? So as you can see, it's, uh, it's, it's defense expenditure, which is the, the third bar. 
Uh, so defense expenditure has grown by about 200%. Uh, so this is, this is enormous. Um, so, so really, um, when you look at the, 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 def the deficit, when you look at the sort of the composition of the ex government expenditure, when you look at the inflation, especially after May 2021, this really points to me that really it's the war, which is the, the key reason uh, for this, uh, for the ill health of the Ethiopian economy, while the IMF report tends to ascribe this to, to COVID um, and sort of exacerbated by uh, conflict um, and also war in, in Ukraine. But actually, for me, it, it's very clear that the elephant in the room is actually the conflict. And as you know, even Prime Minister Dr. Abi himself a year ago said the Ethiopian economy was growing by 6% while the rest of the world was really not growing at all or, 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 or decelerating. So, so really ascribing this to sort of, you know, COVID and other external factors is, I found it to be bizarre. And the other indicator for the health, for the macroeconomic health of an economy is, uh, is of course, uh, balance of payment. So, you know, sort of trade balance and uh, grants and loans, uh, foreign exchange reserve and stuff like that. So this graph has that. So this graph sort of shows what was the trend uh, in the last three years um, in terms of, for example, the Forex reserve. So the Forex reserve is the blue, the blue color. So this is compared to what has been bef before 2019, 2020. So, so that, that, that blue negative shows that the, the, the reserve has actually declined in 2018, 2020, 20, 2019, 2020, compared to the, year, the previous year. And similarly, in 2020, 2021, it got deteriorated. And then currently, it, it, it has gotten even much worse. So, so the same thing for all the, those indicators, whether offshore transfers, grants, and concessional loans. For trade balance, is the balance between imports and exports. So everything has been deteriorated, as you can see, compared to the year, the year 2018 and 2019. So only the trade balance, the red one, has slightly, it showed slight improvement in 2019 and 2020. Uh, and then it got worse in 2020, 2021, and then a lot worse uh, in, in the current year. This graph shows the sort of, this is the real effective exchange rate and nominal effective exchange rate. So this sort of shows the, how the Ethiopian bill is doing compared to the sort of the weighted uh, currencies of the world. So this particularly is this this particular graph sort of shows the trend in over over uh, over valuation of the Ethiopian beer. As you know, as, there, as you know, IMF is always saying the Ethiopian beer is overvaluated. So at the moment it's about fifty two beer. So IMF believes that the market rate should be a lot higher than that. So somehow there is because it's somehow controlled the exchange rate in Ethiopia. It's, it's kind of called, it's, it's managed floating. So government is somehow controlling it. So there is always a, a tendency for the bird to be overvaluated. So that's why we have a huge uh, parallel market margin at the moment around 50%. So really that's what, that shows you that the bird is over, overvaluated. So, but then there was a trend, a declining trend in, in over evaluation of BIR, because as you know, the, the Ethiopian Central Bank has been, um, you know, the, the, the rate of devaluation of the, the BIR or, or depreciation of the BIR was faster in the last couple of years, as you know. So it went from around 30% to around 52% in a matter of, in a couple of years, as you know. So that means the overvaluation of BIR was going down. However, this is the nominal effective exchange rate. But the real effective exchange rate takes into account the price level in Ethiopia and the rest of the world. So you see the huge gap that really shows that actually the, the overvaluation of the bur in terms of real exchange rate has been worsening. And that's precisely why the, the black market rate, the black market or the parallel market rate is a lot higher than the, the official exchange rate. So this really shows you the sort of inflation that we talked about. Another very important uh, measure, especially of interest to the IMF, is debt. Um, so this, is, this, this, this graph shows the sort of the total uh, pu public debt of Ethiopia. 
divided into domestic debt and, and external debt. So in general, the, the amount of uh, domestic debt and uh, external debt in Ethiopia are, are pretty comparable. Um, and at the moment, uh, as you can see from the graph, domestic debt is about 27% of GDP. So, so the Ethiopian GDP, as you know, is around, is around $100 billion, right? Uh, so if 27% of GDP is domestic debt, so that means uh, around $27 billion of domestic debt, so in terms of dollars, even though the debt is denominated in dirt. And the foreign debt is around, is slightly higher, is around $29 billion, uh, which is also around 29% of GDP, if we assume the Ethiopian GDP is around $100 billion. So, so overall, the, the, the total GDP, the, I mean, the total debt, the cumulative debt, of Ethiopia is, if you add those two, is around 56% of GDP. So this is not very high compared to so many countries. So many countries, so many developing countries have actually uh, debt around 100% of the GDP or more. However, the problem with Ethiopia is, even though, for example, if you take uh, the, the external debt, which is around 30% of GDP, uh, it's not much. However, our ability to get dollars our ability to export and get dollars is very weak. So our ability to, to pay is, is very weak. So that's why um, even though overall, you know, debt, foreign debt, uh, external debt is not more than 30%, we really struggle uh, to pay because our, our, our export is very weak. Our tax, tax base is, is, is very, very weak. And of course, at the moment, exacerbated by, by war um, and also, uh, of course, uh, you know, war in Ukraine as well, uh, and also to some extent COVID. Um, so, so this is a sort of the, the the picture in terms of in terms of debt. And as you know, Ethiopia has requested the this group of uh, creditors. Uh, you know, most of them are like G G G G seven G G twenty countries and the Paris Club, and also you have countries like emerging countries like China. Uh, who uh, actually are the main creditors at the moment. So Ethiopia has uh, sort of requested for rescheduling of date you know, or some sort of date cancellation or some sort of extension and, and stuff like that. So that's being discussed at the moment. Uh, so along, along with uh, Chad and, and Namibia. But in general, IMF in, is calling on those big creditors to really uh, restructure date for most of the, the, the developing uh, world. Uh, so this is the financing gap. Uh, so, so, so I said, you know, even though the, the, the date doesn't seem very high, in real terms, it's very hard for Ethiopia to service. And that's why Ethiopia applied for the, for the debt servicing, for the debt uh, treatment under the common framework. Um, so, so in 2019, uh, as you know, uh, the sort of the, the financing gap uh, was around, uh, it was more than $8 billion. And as you all remember, IMF uh, gave around $3 billion dollars so for that, and this was also a sort of part of the the the, the reform, um, a part of the homegrown um, economic re re reform agenda. So so at the moment, IMF doesn't know yet how much the the sort of the financing gap is. They, they in the report they mentioned they are sort of working on it, but they they believe that this is going to be a lot more than that. So this is the sort of the picture um, that the IMF, uh, sort of based on the IMF report. In my opinion, it's it's largely accurate report in terms of uh, explaining the challenges like inflation, slowing down growth, and, and usually inflation when it's combined with a sort of slowdown is is, is very dangerous. Uh, and also the the macro imbalances that we talked about, the debt problem that we talked about, the, the and, and the financing gap at, at the moment. Uh, however, the sort of this report ascribes this, this, this challenges to COVID and then somehow exacerbated by conflict and, uh, and the war in Ukraine. Um, in my opinion, really, the, 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 the real cause of this problem is the war, as we also saw how expenditure, uh, different expenditure has really skyrocketed. We, we saw how inflation really jumped, not when uh, COVID started, really it's after the war. Um, so, so, so really whatever recommendation IMF should come should really uh, hinge up on peace. And in, in the report, 
somehow they really uh, seem to, to, to think that things have normalized in Ethiopia. While there is war everywhere in the country, mostly in the north, uh, mostly in Tigray, but there is, there is war in Oromia, there is war in Ben Shangu, and also as um, Faisal mentioned, there is also conflict in the Somali region. So, so really uh, saying that the situation in Ethiopia is normal, and while around 7 million people in Tigray are completely blocked and sieged and, and denied uh, basic uh, services that the Ethiopian constitution provides to any Ethiopian, uh, you know, access to electricity, to telecom, to, to education, to, to health. Um, so, in, so in this situation, saying things are normalized is, is for me, is, is unethical and immoral. And also, to say the least, um, uh, and also to say that there is there is attempts for for negotiation, but no single negotiating meeting has has been conducted. So to say that things are now fine, uh, and then then you know, uh, for me was really a very biased uh, assessment of, of 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 the situation. Uh, back to you, uh, Professor Gitacho. Thank you, Zagai, for that overview and for your uh, reflection on the political economy of that. So, uh, Zagai uh, and Faisal, you saw the report, and uh, I think many will be waiting for you to give them an insight into the political economy, the implication, the reading. What we are seeing on this screen is directly from that report, where they talk about the ceasefire, the rebuilding all that even the humanitarian aid you think the world accelerated over the past three months scale well um <clears throat> from reading the report i think this is the imf uh and they say stated clearly they, that they want to help ethiopia that they're committed to to assisting ethiopia in other words the imf really wants to come to the rescue of ethiopia um, as Dr. Zagai said, the economic outlook uh, is grim, it's dark. Uh, in some ways, uh, as you said, it could be, uh, uh, could be said that it is uh, accurate to some extent, but the intent of the report is to um, assure uh, the donors and the financiers and the board of the IMF to extend this financing gap credit to Ethiopia or to restructure the debt, to reschedule it, to do whatever it is that so that Ethiopia could uh, uh, be sustained in the future. So in that sense, I think that this is a political document. Maybe the pressure is coming from the politicos uh, who are actually um, sponsoring the IMF itself, that the Ethiopian state is not in a very good shape, politically speaking. But if they did uh, left Ethiopia to its own devices, it could be even worse. It, so to try to rescue it from make uh, from uh, uh, the situation deteriorating to worse situation than this is that the the IMF has an obligation to have to come to the rescue of Ethiopia. This is not not only to help Ethiopia. Ethiopia has creditors. Ethiopia is uh, ex, uh, has a, a participant in international trade. It exports. Uh, all of these uh, uh, clients with Ethiopia are going to be affected if nothing is done about it. So the, the budget shortfall, the financing shortfall, the gap must be filled. And it looks like the IMF is the ideal organization to do that. That the financing system or the financial system in the world needs to be healthy. And if a, an economy as big as Ethiopia uh, uh, is, is allowed to go down the drain, then that is going to have an effect, at least on the regional economy, and that will not be uh, having a good uh, prospect for the world economy uh, in general, because there are also other drivers in the world economy that are putting downward pressure on the world economy in general. So in this case, if nothing is done to, to, to Ethiopia to help Ethiopia, the country could, uh, could implode. Uh, because of economic pressure, so that they're trying to relieve that economic pressure in addition to the other, the other uh, uh, political and, uh, and uh, co conflict uh, uh, problems that Ethiopia is suffering. So they're really coming to the rescue of Ethiopia. And to do that, they try to convince the donors and the financiers and the board. Now, if 
um, we look at all of these uh, multiple shocks that the Ethiopian economy had suffered from, which the report identifies, the pandemic, the conflict, the high inflation, the foreign exchange uh, problems, the drought, the uh, locust infestation, the other uh, impacts from um, the Ukraine, for instance, the third Ukraine conflict uh, in terms of uh, supply. Uh, if you put all of this together, I'm not even sure that this, uh, this report is accurate. I think it is trying to impress. It's trying to put a better face than it is in order to convince the, the, the creditors, convince the creditors of Ethiopia that the Ethiopian situation is not as bad as you think. Uh, war has abated, they say. War has abetted the uh, 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 humanitarian uh, uh, supply to Tigray has improved uh, in the Oromia region where war is really raging. Uh, what they're saying is that intercommunal uh, conflict is still there. They are going to have to have, they're going to have some pressure on the Ethiopian economy, but they're not really acknowledging the scale, the scale of the conflict in the Oromia region. And the Oromia region is not like uh, in other, other regions. It is basically the center of the Ethiopian um, agricultural uh, uh, economy and other uh, uh, sectors of the economy. It is really central. That's one thing. So they're trying to, to build uh, a case for extending or coming to the rescue of uh, Ethiopia's finances. The second thing that I noticed in addition, because the, the the, the drivers are really big, they're huge, they're not easy. And that Ethiopian economy grew uh, in spite of all of these pressures and continuing conflict, that it grew at 6.8 uh, uh, or whatever percent that they say, to me is really doubtful. It is doubtful because in the Oromia region, uh, because of the conflict, there were supply, uh, supply problems, uh, harvest problems. Uh, I, I'm not sure how agriculture, health, and the mining sector performed more than expected in, in Ethiopia, as, as the report says. Uh, in the Oromia region, for instance, the agriculture, I mean, they have the numbers, I cannot say, but it's just suspect to me that um, uh, in, in, in at least Western Oromia, there is um, uh, some, uh, there is conflict in that area that prevented uh, agriculture tax collection uh, how agriculture and health and mining uh, in Oromia, in Ethiopia in general, perform more than expected uh, is, is doubtful. But in all areas, in all sectors, uh, agriculture, mining, uh, trade in balance, um, what I see is uh, an economy that is struggling and the IMF has made a political decision to try to uh, put the best face, face that they can on the Ethiopian economy to to convince, um, to convince the donors and the, the, the financiers and um, the, the, the board of the IMF uh, itself. One thing that I did not see in this is that the cost of the military, uh, the policy, the impact of the policy, which uh, Dr. Sagai just uh, talked about, the homegrown economic policy, the policy effects, all of this I did not see. In general, though, they're trying to put the best face that they can uh, in order to make sure that the creditors actually buy uh, their report. Okay, thank you, Oskel. Uh, Faisal? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Tagay, for that uh, uh, synopsis of the report, the G20 framework. I think it's Ethiopia, Chad, and Zambia that are now to be evaluated this, uh, this period and the president of IMF is on record to say that they have no comment when they were asked as to how they read their uh, report vis-a-vis -vis the current civil war in Ethiopia. And basically, they took a hike and they said no comment. That is not really saying much uh, in terms of where IMF uh, stands from uh, the point of view of Ethiopia's political economy. Just a little, you know, kind of context, uh, Ethiopia is one of the earliest members of uh, IMF, 1945. And there are very clear mission that the IMF maintains. As Scale was saying, this money comes from creditors. There are people who watch the money that 
they give to these countries such as Ethiopia. So they want to make sure that their money is uh, safe. So I think the three missions that I gleaned from the report, one, it is uh, to encourage uh, monetary cooperation in the world and two, to help expand <coughs> trade and growth, both internally as well as externally. And three, to encourage policies that would uh, not harm prosperity uh, of the country. So we can come back to this, but I think one thing that I like to say is uh, the data that IMF uses in order to chart Ethiopia's position is mostly self-supporting data. The most of the data is, is reported by Ethiopia's you know statistical department and Ethiopia's uh, economic. So as Scal was alluding to, how much of this is really uh, real? Is, uh, is a question. If you recall last week, we talked about how Abiy said he, the, his, the federal government collected 93% of the targeted revenue that they were trying to, you know, collect. And the same way now, all the regions are reporting around that. So Mali region, despite the famine and the, the hardship, they reported 96% of the revenue target were reported, were collected according to them. I think Oromia also came and said something in 95. So this music would be played to just satisfy the threshold that Abi built. Having said that, I think, I think the report very much uh, shows how uh, Ethiopia is, is a very serious patient that cannot be really uh, covered. A year ago, we remember IMF refused to to issue a report on Ethiopia because the numbers were so bad and so low and the prospect for peace was not there. And the Ethiopian leadership was recalcitrant to talk both to the internal forces as well as to the external that IMF didn't see any merit to even go and put together Ethiopia's forecast. The question is why now with this uh, very uh, gloomy image, IMF would like to to sh you know see if they can find a solution, as the guy was saying. What what tools can IMF bring to the table to restructure Ethiopia's debt, to infuse some credit, more credit, if you will? I think because historically, both IMF and World Bank has two functions for the third world. Either they kill a third world country that they don't like, i.e. Zimbabwe is a very good example, or they can resuscitate a country that they want to favor and see if they can inject more credit. I think at this point in time, Ethiopia is at the apex where the IMF is showing that a guy of presentation, such as negotiation of the Tigray conflict, uh, showing good governance. Because at this point in time, if IMF is loyal to its guidelines, and they have about 10 guidelines that really look to when a credit is restructured, when a new line is opened for a country like Ethiopia, those guidelines are being violated by Ethiopia, whether it's the human rights issue, whether it's good governance, where it's what is happening in terms of the civil war, the over ex, uh, uh, spending of uh, of the few dollars that the country has on the military, as opposed to other social services, because at the end of the day, both IMF and World Bank and USAID and all those entities that the West uses to really manipulate all the politics and political economy of the world have their own guidelines, and none of those guidelines are now met by the Ethiopian government. So, in a way there has been some behind the door discussions for Ethiopia A to supply data and give information and B, IMF to look favorably the issues and the, the item is that Ethiopia provides, you know, and give us, provide that A, B, C, D is done, including and primarily start talking about peace when it comes to the Tigray situation. So it's really, Garbage in, garbage out, as they say in the statistical analysis, what you see and what the guy went through could be right or wrong. 
from you know technical point of view and from statistical point of view those of us who studied economics you can tell you can put anything into that and what comes out is what the driver at that point wants to see through the hypothesis having said that i really this as much as i'm critical of the ethiopian federal government but as somebody who cares i would like to caution uh, the IMF's recommendation is to be taken wholeheartedly in its totality. Most of the countries that IMF worked with in terms of restructuring, uh, monetary restructuring and what have you, did not come clean or stronger. Somalia was destroyed after it came back from the 1977-78 war because of a massive IMF restructuring that the government readily accepted to move from it is proto-socialist system to a more open market capitalist system which is what imf and world bank push so my only misgiving about the imf's approach to this is a i think they will try to push ethiopia beyond the political issues a complete uh, uh, privatization, which may or may not help the people of Ethiopia, but most likely may hurt the poor people in the country. And B, it, this restructuring of IMF, if Ethiopia 100% accepts the program, may as well kill the Ethiopian economy or the Ethiopian, you know, little thing that they have. You know, that could be one scenario. The other scenario could be a very well functioning and well structured the IMF debt relief and debt restructuring that the country can come back. Lastly, I think one can ask why is IMF and creditors who trust Ethiopia at this juncture when a civil war is even starting in Oromia, when the Tigray civil war hasn't stopped, when the Somali region that was claimed to have been the only peaceful is now under the threat of Al-Shabaab, where many multiple national liberation fronts are now popping up as they did in the 1980s and 1970s during the Dergo War. I think the only answer that I can come up with is that IMF shows the creditors what Ethiopia's miracle and economic miracle achieved in the last 20 years prior to this and say, hey, this country is capable to register 9%, 10%, 11% growth if we give them the right environment. And those right environments, in my opinion, are three. Number one, a complete cessation of hostility and removal and elimination of the civil war in Ethiopia and bringing everybody back to the table in a nice, in a way that everybody accepted the negotiation and all inclusive talks, that's number one. Number two, bringing to a halt the massive human rights abuse that Ethiopian government is carrying. And number three, coming up with a system of governance, whether that governance is multinational federalism or not, that can finally contain all the gurubis who are vying for power or attention in the Ethiopian landscape. If those three issues can be guaranteed to IMF and the creditors, I think a good restructuring uh, program can be put on the table without killing Ethiopia's economy, as it has been in many other countries through IMF and World Bank. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Faisal. Uh, I think that uh, the three conditions you mentioned, the ifs, the big ifs, I guess, uh, takes me to my last question for each one of you. Uh, we'll start with Sagai. Uh, Sagai, you, you can also I want to ask something because I was talking to an economist yesterday who saw this report and he said he had an idea that the economy is in bad shape but what he saw in this report uh, was even worse than what he thought uh, before reading it. So you can comment on that as well but being peace are the big parameter that is you know considered by imf as well and faisal mentioned uh, i think we have to mention that uh, after two invoice and the third acting invoice uh, uh, quit uh, you know the invoice of the us to the horn of africa uh, we know the new invoice yesterday uh, even if he started officially june 1st 
Uh, yesterday, he met with uh, representatives of the Ethiopian diaspora from different communities and so on. So we know as well, the US has a big hand in uh, the negotiations that hopefully many people are saying might start in Nairobi anytime soon. So what would make this time the for the envoy, if we count the acting envoy as well, uh, who just uh, left the position, what would make or what kind of conditions are we hoping uh, to hope that it might work this time around? Uh, Saga? Um, uh, yes. Um, so, so I think um, I agree with uh, Professor Gale and, and Faisal in sort of questioning uh, some of the data uh, that, that I may have, you know, used or analyzed. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's to be expected as well, you know, data inaccuracies in a developing country context uh, as well. Um, um, uh, but the situation overall, the, the challenges that the, the economic challenges that the country has uh, uh, are, are pretty bleak and, and the report pretty much shows that, even though the report also tends to say that despite all these challenges, civil war, uh, COVID and uh, the war in, on Ukraine, somehow the government has shown a sort of a, a fiscal discipline. That's, that's somehow their conclusion, which I, which I disagree in my opinion, uh, because um, as, as at the very beginning, uh, as I mentioned, uh, at the moment, uh, imports of capital goods, which is very important for, for economic development, um, has been pretty much halted at the moment. And, and um, uh, and also, you know, um, the, the the inflation we see is 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 is, is really 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 concerning. Uh, and the war everywhere in the country, the conflicts, and the sort of the denial of basic services to more than seven million people. Um, so it's it's all bleak. Um, and for me, it's. Uh, it's uh, uh, pretty much as I, I as as I expected. Uh, the, the only, I mean, the main sort of my main concern, as as I mentioned, is ascribing these challenges to sort of externalizing them to to COVID or the war in Ukraine. Uh, while really the elephant in the room is is the war, and any recommendation should really hinge, as I said earlier, on sort of ensuring peace. Uh, but this report somehow assumes that things are normal now, which is completely inaccurate. And that makes me believe, like Professor Gale says, it might be some sort of a political uh, sort of decision to, to portray that, yeah, Ethiopia has a challenge, but the government is somehow managing it. So let's really, you know, support them. That seems the message uh, from the report. Uh, while, uh, as I said earlier, 7 million people in Tigray and so many other, so many millions elsewhere are really denied from basic services. So <laughs> to give you a context, the other two countries that the IMF is trying to bail out are, are Chad and Zambia. Their population is actually just twice as much as the, the population of Tigray. So, so really for the sake of, you know, whatever political um, agenda, um, somehow undermining uh, the the bleak and the inhuman conditions that people of Tigray and elsewhere are living and some brushing this off for me is, 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 is very, very, very disappointing. So, so when I say the report is accurate, the report is somehow accurate in sort of showing the challenges, but it's, inaccu it's not accurate in sort of ascribing it to some sort of external factors while the country really dragged itself into this problem. Uh, uh, in a, in a somehow in a systematic way. Um, so really, there is a peace effort uh, happening, but this is really, really, really premature. Um, what if it doesn't work? Um, so at the moment, 7 million people in Tigray denied from basic services, from a, 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 any basic, basic, basic minimum uh, services at the moment, and, and Ethiopia, if Ethiopia is going to get billions of dollars, what, 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 what do you think the sort of reaction from, 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 from the other negotiating party, from, from, from the Tigray government? 
so so really as you all know ethiopia is a federal system where where the federal where power is shared by the federal government and by the regional government one is not uh one doesn't have more power than the other they, there is a power sharing so i know i understand imf all multilateral institutions deal with the federal government with the central government but in the ethiopian context you have for example tigray a region with with somehow a, a, a regional government functioning regional government government despite all this uh siege and, and, and block, blockage so any sort of negotiations it could be reconstruction or anything i think bringing uh, the, the regional government on board uh would really help uh for sort of sustainable uh peace and also successful uh expenditure of uh of, of, of the of the financing you know the financing is not free I mean if it's gonna give it might give money but it's not free there is interest rate it might be concessional so the future generation not including the people of Tigray including the people in in Oromia region uh, in Ben Shango who are suffering from this uh, from this challenge all of us are going are, are going to pay to pay this so so everybody should be brought in board and uh, I, IMF should not only engage just one one one, one party I think it should in, engage everyone uh, so that a sort of sustainable uh, solution can be achieved back to you uh, professor thank you uh, that guy scale I mean with regard to <clears throat> The numbers are the numbers, the reports are the numbers, the report has a purpose, and I don't want to reiterate what the purpose is. If Ethiopia is not rescued, it's going to go down, and that's going to be a burden on the region. The region is going to be a burden on um, inter international trade, because that corridor, especially the, uh, the, the, the Red Sea and uh, that corridor, uh, uh, is about accounts for about 40% of international uh, trade. So it's it's going to have an impact. They have to do something about it. And to do that, they have to convince at least their own board uh, to release some funds. But in general, for, for uh, an economic turnaround in Ethiopia, okay, let me go back. The, the, the situation is bleak. The future seems, seems grim to, as far as I'm concerned because we haven't seen the impact of the war on the Ethiopian economy just yet. Especially in areas other than Tigray, in some other areas, the impact of not um, farming, the impact of uh, disruption, all of these have not been felt entirely. They have not been felt yet especially in agricultural production, in food production, the impact is going to be felt next year or maybe uh, in, in, in the near future, in, in months, it's going to be felt. Um, so peace, of course, is important for any kind of economic activity to, uh, to take place, but there is no peace and there is no prospect of peace. There is a lull in fighting in, in Ethiopia in the north. There, is, there are no bullets flying in the north, but there is absolutely there is no peace. There is no active economy in that area. The impact of the, the war on northern Ethiopia has, is, is going to be felt in the future. So that's, that's great. Now, war disrupts economic activities. It disrupts production. It disrupts distribution. It disrupts consumption, no doubt about that. But it also... Um, uh, uh, has impacted because it diverts it diverts the uh, labor to um, and resources to financing the war itself. In the case of Ethiopia, it's not like the United States or anywhere else where the military industrial complex actually benefits from war. In Ethiopia, every war making capacity is imported. That means when they are importing uh, shells and uh, ammunition, bullets, and uh, all kinds of uh, technologies of war, the amount of money that they spend on that is taken away from other productive activities. So as long as there is no, as there is a state of war in the country, as long as there is no stability, this is going to continue, that the turnaround is not going to be uh, possible. There is one thing economists must also pay attention to uh, in this respect. 
it, the economy requires number one policy and of course management economic management some of the impacts on this on the grim economic prospect that we just saw is it's also not of the conflict or pandemic or others but also economic mismanagement the capacity of managing this economy have for some reason uh, has declined ethiopia under the developmental state had clear policy uh, objectives that it was using ethiopia's uh, uh, comparative advantages to finance long-term uh, growth, to fund uh, long-term growth, that has completely changed today. So the impact of policy and economic management, it doesn't give me hope that this economy could be turned around uh, again, because under the under the PP, this is the policy not to do, to, to, to improve performance, uh, the performance of the European economy in, in, in several uh, sectors. It is to bring about prosperity. And that is simply a wishful thinking and the economic policy and economic management itself does not promise a turnaround uh, in Ethiopia. The third thing that one which we did not pay attention to what that needs to be um, uh, um, that we need to pay attention to is the human impact. The impact of this slowing economy, the, 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 the unemployment, the inflation. I'm not sure the 35% inflation of course, the numbers are the numbers, as I was just saying, but for a person who is really going to a restaurant and, and, and buying a cup of tea, they could feel it in their pocketbook that the inflation is much, much higher than 20% uh, uh, or 35%. The unemployment, at least, for instance, in the Chinese economy, the contraction of 1% amounts to 15, per 15 million people losing their jobs. So that part of it, that part of the impact of this slowing, drastically slowing down economy on, on, on the Ethiopian population, the human cost has not been accounted for. Having said that, um, all of these, like the, the prospect of turnaround is not uh, promising as far as I'm concerned. And the, him, the impact, the impact on humans, on unemployment, on youth unemployment, inflation, um, one cannot say that it's not just going to be an economic turnaround, but the political ramifications uh, are yet to be seen uh, in the Ethiopian context. I think everything is really in a spiral as far as um, the political economy of the country is concerned. Um, but what I would like to say at the end is maybe go back to my own theme, maybe in the last little bit, my own theme. The reason that I am emphasizing this mismanagement of the economy is that everything in Ethiopia, diplomacy, military, economy, they have to serve the interest of one man. If they're not serving the interest of one man, they're not considered uh, operational. That's the roots, uh, the root of the problem. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Faisal? Well, I think, uh, you know, in general, I would, I would agree with is said, uh, I think IMF is uh, is having a difficulty to work with uh, US political decision makers to see if there is any way to resuscitate a dying strategic friend of the United States and the West. There's nothing else why uh, IMF and other entities, but particularly in this case, IMF would go, you know, the nine yard to see if they can rescue Ethiopia while they know that they're working with a broken system. I mean, you don't get an insurance. The same, by the way, the same companies that give us insurance or loans for homes in America, one way or another, indirectly also make into the banks that create these creditors by far. So nobody throws money after a bad project. With all intents and purposes, Ethiopia today is a bad project. Not only the war, but as we have been saying, the two most productive regional governments in Ethiopia are Oromia and Amhara, but mainly Oromia. And they're there are wars in both. I don't understand how anybody who's putting money into a project 
will think that your return would be great or secure and safe while you know farms are burning and the farmer is being killed i mean it doesn't make sense so what the us and imf are prioritizing is not really economic indicators per se they are prioritizing the strategic interest that they have in ethiopia as a big partner so there is a push coming from the state department and from biden's office to work with ethiopia no matter what and businessmen usually know how to bend the rules so in my argument i would say that imf knowing that ethiopia is a basket case economically despite the numbers that they are showing is bending the rules to serve other strategic interests here for instance one of the key guidelines of the imf is i think as kyle was mentioning good public policy in place and there is no good public policy in any part of ethiopia i'll just give you a small example of how things don't work and any business investor will not really see attraction in ethiopia jigjiga has the same distance equal distance between jigjiga and hargeisa and jigjiga and redo literally the same between hargeisa and jigjiga there is only one checkpoint that business people who come from hargeisa to jigjiga stop and that's tokwajale and that's the border town between ethiopia and somalia between jigjiga and dredawa there are eight checkpoints that literally ransack everything that poor people and small business people have do imf people know this of course they know there are millions of cases of small scale but detrimental uh, condition is that they see beyond the wall the other thing that my my i think it was the guy who mentioned that this money that imf is loaning to ethiopia will have the same shape that the chinese money today has in ethiopia so in few years people will not be talking about the chinese debt they but they will be talking about the western debt which will also compound in itself now most of that money could end up not in 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 development sector but in the hands of i think it was a guy who was mentioning in 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 favorable people that the federal government works with because one of the key components of imf is investment strategic approach to this situation is to put money in the hands of business people so that they can grow the private sector in the current political situation in ethiopia cronyism is probably one of the highest in the world so that that most of that money that is allotted to go to all the regions and business people throughout the 911 uh, regional governments will end up in the hands of cronies that abi and his team and pp will care so as much as in the past we have seen people who became millionaires within a short period of time despite that many ethiopians were starving today we would see even that effort doubling and people becoming instantly millionaires which is already happening so i think there are a lot of issues that i think imf is literally uh, uh, trying to not see intentionally and i think uh, the situation in ethiopia is not being assessed from economic point of view although i'm not denying that the covid pressure was there but uh, you know to really give this kind of restructuring that ethiopia at this particular time when what 70% of the of the economy is attributed given to the to the war in two regions only in oromia and in in tigray but soon when that war expands i don't know where the rest of the of the you know country's asset will be going but in in general i think uh, i think uh, there should have been stronger tools in the hands of imf to coerce the Ethiopian government to attend to real issues such as the war in Tigray, the war in Oromia, human rights issues, democratization of the country, good governance, and a constitution that speaks, multinational constitution that speaks to a more and stronger and decentralized federal system. None of those, none of those are on the table that IMF is using, and IMF is an arm of the of the of the west i'll just conclude by saying that uh, samuel huntington who was the western and america's dean of political science and who took the chairman chairmanship after george cannon who coined the detente uh, 
was a very avowed uh, supporter of Ethiopia as a developmental uh, 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 system that the previous government carried. But he said in his clashes of civilization, one really glowing uh, comment that everybody needs to know. He was at the time trying to suppress Islamic and Eastern civilization, i.e. Somalia. And he basically recommended that the West, and this is Samuel Huntington, the late Samuel Huntington, the West needs to use IMF and the World Bank to pump up Ethiopia and destroy Somalia. It's on the record. What this tells you is that IMF is not a political entity. It's a political entity used by the West the way they want. This time in the Ethiopian context, IMF is no longer a financial entity. It's also a strategic political entity serving the, the White House to see if they can accommodate Abiy's government at this particular time. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, this is a direct quote from the reports. And uh, for me, what uh, to your point and to the points of both uh, the guy and this girl, uh, their conclusion is despite the numbers and everything that the graphs show, the government is committed to reforms. Therefore, we have to help them. So that's, you know, where I think the key word is. Gentlemen, we are uh, one hour and a quarter, but we still have maybe to do the final thoughts session. So uh, part of the uh, show. So Sagai, final thoughts from your side very briefly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, um, with all the concerns, um, as Gail and uh, you know, Faisal uh, mentioned about uh, uh, loans and and all the required uh, economic policies, capability, uh, institution building, and stuff like that, still poor countries will will, will need money. So I, I personally have no problem the IMF uh, providing loans to Ethiopia, the creditors uh, structuring the Ethiopian debt, but um, they should be, you know, it, this should be really based on a, a credible um, commitment uh, by the government that the finances are not going to be uh, used for war. Um, and rather, they will be used for for actual reforms. Uh, the, the lesson from the last three years um, actually is, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, despite the, the government's commitment to make the private sector the engine of growth, um, actual performance um, was 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 really uh, below expectation. The government is actually getting bigger, and the private sector is, is has actually shrunk. Just you know, just one 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 statistic is uh, the the employment by the private sector in Ethiopia, uh, in in the whole country, is informal private sector employment is less than five percent. Uh, government actually employs more uh, in 2020, uh, based on the 2020 uh, National Labour Force Survey. Uh, so that's actually worse than before. So, so despite the government's commitment to sort of make the private sector, uh, you know, the, the, the engine of growth, the, uh, you know, in actual, in practice, that's not the case. So, of course, we see, you know, partial privatization of the telecom somehow to send mixed signals. So, so, so I agree there is really lack of clarity about the sort of roadmap, um, the development roadmap of the country. There is a need to, to clarify that. And, 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 and lastly, uh, Definitely, IMF and all the creditors should take into account the, the denial of basic uh, services to so many millions of people in Ethiopia that should be addressed. That's like, that's, that's a really, really basic, basic minimum any country in the world should, should fulfill. Thank you. Thank you, Saga. Let's parting talks. Well, uh, I don't have any problem if Ethiopia uh, Ethiopia's economy improved. Whether this is the PP government or any other government, people uh, need to have to sustain their livelihoods. In that respect, if the IMF is interested in ameliorating the conditions of life for Ethiopians, regardless of the government, um, uh, that would be a, a fine thing to do. But uh, 
Um, on the other hand, like Faisal said, why invest in a bad project that has definitely no return? And that's the issue. And I just want to say this again so that people um, understand where all of this is coming. But I'm just going to underscore what I said at the beginning. There are, there are uh, Mr. Abi Ahmed is now the, the de facto leader in, uh, and the, the only leader uh, in the country. Uh, the institutions of government are not autonomous. Everything, decision-making is done. Every decision is, uh, is made in the prime minister's office. This is not just because the prime minister is interested in making good decisions for good governance in the country. It's because he is sick. He cannot delegate. He wants to make sure that nobody is doing anything that he does not approve of or he doesn't know. Now, bad project, it could be economic policies or economic management or any other uh, policies that the government pursues. Of course, a government such as Ethiopia of governing about 120 million people cannot be run by one man, one government, one man in the government. It cannot be just run from, from Arat Kilo. As I was saying at the beginning, for instance, uh, the worst leaders in the world, the worst one, the worst exemplars, they, they have been diagnosed with personality disorders. Stalin had been diagnosed with a narcissistic personality disorder. He had other personality disorders as well. That's Stalin. Um, Hitler has narcissistic uh, personality disorder, sadistic personality disorder, borderline borderline personality disorder, and as Asperger's syndrome. He was a sick man. Today, like uh, last uh, in, in the last four years, when the United States had um, uh, Trump in the White House, almost 35 known psychiatrists have diagnosed him with personality disorders. The situation in Ethiopia is worse than that. I think you can look at this week, this histrionic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, no matter what the IMF does, no matter what the institutions do, there is a problem. The issue of peace, the issue of polit uh, uh, policy correctness or appropriateness, or economic turnaround, they are all tied to something, just one thing. There is probably, the problems in the country are indissoluble. They're indissoluble. I don't understand why IMF misses this point or anybody else misses this point. They are indissoluble. If you look at that picture, you could see something is terribly awry, it's not terribly wrong. So no matter what the IMF does, whether they approve 850 um, million or anything else for them, as long as they are going to be managed by a personality that is suffering from disorder, nothing matters. Nothing matters. Thank you, Stel. Uh, Faisal, the final, final word is from you. Yeah, no, I, I think I honestly feel bad for the people of Ethiopia, the 110 million people. We're experiencing, uh, you know, on the record officially, what, 38% inflation, but probably it's in the area of 50% when, you know, a little uh, container of oil costs or takes the salary of a well-paid middle-class type person. So those people are really under tremendous duress that we cannot imagine. I just want the IMF to be loyal to its own guidelines and philosophies. I will not uh, so much criticize IMF for its financial analysis, for they are really good at making financial analysis. Although any creditor who is a member of the, of the banks that put money into the IMF pocket, such as Chase Manhattan or City, you know, City Bank or whatever, will not really put their money in a project in America that's similar to, to what Ethiopia is today. But for whatever reason, let us say 
maybe the financial analysis is right so there are willing creditors who are you know ready to put their money into ethiopia at this particular time but the indicators don't really justify for anybody to invest in this country and at the end of the day imf and all those are nothing but investment seeking for a good return and less risk having said that the second part of imf which i really want them to just pay more attention is to their multi-sectoral uh, guidelines that really addresses issues of equity issues on women issues on small scale development issues of gender and what have you and and also protection of human rights and protection of uh, indigents in the country the people who are dying in the wars that the ethiopian decision makers are pushing are not really your typical you know highly educated urban based person it's also mainly the farmers and the poor people who toil who need to be protected largely female headed households are the ones who are being impacted and here i see imf undermining its own principles and guidelines and when you go to their books this is what they talk in the multi sectoral section of it you know with that i think you know i will just uh, abridge one thing some book that uh, uh, was written in the 80s by uh, a development uh, uh, economics scholar no shortcut to progress I think Ethiopia has no shortcut to stability. You cannot really cut the long road and hard work to get stability without really addressing the real issues. And I think IMF is expected to coerce, as opposed to the sentence that you shared with us, saying that Ethiopian leaders are willing and committed to reform. And 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 you know, while we know that the worst the worst war is taking place in Oromia as we speak today, or families are starving or not having the, the small thing of telephone conversation with their daughter who won a medal in the Olympics. If IMF cannot coerce the Ethiopian decision makers to address those issues, I don't even know how they will coerce them on big issues. And I think IMF is dropping the ball here, in my opinion. Thank you, uh, Faisal, uh, for that. And uh, yes, uh, Faisal was mentioning about uh, the 10,000 uh, meter gold medalist in Oregon, uh, Letta Sambat Kudai, whose uh, father and mother uh, had to hear it from another person uh, in Tugrai a day later. And they were on the Tugrai television speaking about the last time they saw their daughter, their champion daughter is two years ago. Uh, and uh, that is because of the siege, the communication blockade uh, on Tigray that continues to be, uh, you know, being ignored by IMF and uh, others. Thank you for your insight today. And uh, I'm sure I was uh, looking at the comments that were coming on and uh, there is a lot of appreciation for the insights uh, that uh, you provided today. And we'll be back with uh, another episode next week. Good night from here. Thank you for, for following us. We are on satellite under uh, Horn Broadcasting Services as well in the Horn of Africa. And uh, we were live on Facebook, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And good night. <laughs>